This is CS1101 Lecture 5.1. Today we're going to be talking about objects and in the course of talking about objects as collateral damage we'll also wind up talking about strings, the scanner, and methods. But to begin with we're going to start uh, with an introduction talking about comparisons to make sure we understand how to compare various types and the reasoning behind the way we have to compare each. So first of all, if we're comparing two integers or any set of integers, this is very easy. <clears throat> so nothing special here. We can compare the integer which results from the expression x mod 2 to the integer 0 simply using the uh, equals equals operator, the greater than, less than, the standard relational operators we have already discussed. That'll work just fine. We've discussed that chars are fundamentally stored as integer values, which are then interpreted as an ASCII encoding. However, chars are a primitive type, so they are native in Java, and therefore we are able to use the native comparison operators on these char variable types as well. So we're able to compare the char at index 0 in the string last name with the char a using the equals equals operator. Now understand that this variable last name is a string but we are using a method which is a method that is part of the string class called char at and then we provide the index um, of the location in the string which we would like to get the char from. <clears throat> so this method will return a char value. So we have a char value being compared with a char literal value. And we can use the native relational operators. However, if we're going to be comparing strings, as we've discussed uh, at length already, we need to use the dot equals method because the native relational operators don't always work well with the string class, with objects which are of type string. So if we are going to compare first name, which is a string, with the string Billy Ray to see if they are the same, then we would use the dot equals method. The dot equals method will return a value, um, a Boolean value of true or false. So in this particular instance, um, we are calling this method to test if these strings are equivalent and if they are then we will execute the statements in the curly braces following this if. Based on our discussion so far we would think that comparing floats and doubles would be uh, equally easy since they are also primitive types. That we would be able to use just the standard relational operators to test and see uh, if two numbers are equal. This is true, however, there's some special consideration we have to take when we're dealing with floats and doubles. This is due to the round off error, which we've uh, discussed briefly in a previous lecture. As a reminder, round off error is the fact that a floating point number is an approximation stored in finite space. So if you consider the number 1 divided by 3, so 1 divided by 3 is equal to 0 0.333, and this sequence will continue infinitely. So 0 0.333 with the 3 repeating infinitely. We can't actually represent that in a floating point number because we don't have infinite space with which to encode the number. So we wind up with something more like 0 0.3333333333 and then we just stop. So notice there's a small difference between the real value which is 1 divided by 3, and the floating point approximation of 1 divided by 3. So, <clears throat> if we were to 
do the operation one divided by three and store uh, those results into a variable. So as we've done here, one divided by three, as a, this is a, a floating point literal, divided by floating point literal, so it will result in a floating point literal. So we do one divided by three plus one divided by three plus one divided by three. This should equal one. However, the result of comparing this using the standard of relational operators to one will be false. So if we, if we do 1.0 divided by three and so forth, and we use the relational operator is equal to, and we say 1.0. This is now a Boolean expression because we will evaluate the left-hand side uh, and get some floating point value, and we will compare it to the right-hand side for equivalence, and it will return false. So if we can't check it for equality as we would with integers because of this round-off error, how do we check it? The answer is rather than, rather than considering whether or not two floating point integers are precisely equal, we want to know whether or not they are close enough to be considered equal. So we would declare some threshold, which we would call epsilon, and we would check to see if the numbers were closer than epsilon. So what I mean here is, if we did the check 1 divided by 3.0 plus 1 divided by 3.0 plus 1 divided by 3.0 minus 1, <clears throat> this will not equal 0. However, it will equal some very, very small number, 0 0.0001. So let's just say it'll be some very, very small number. So what we're saying is if 1 and 1 third plus 1 third plus 1 third are only different by this tiny little amount, then they are equal. They're close enough. <clears throat> so it's also important to keep in mind, just depending on how the rounding occurs, this could have been negative 0 0.0001. So we want to actually take the absolute value of the subtraction. And now we can test this. So our Boolean formula changes from is it equal to 1 to is the difference less than 0 0.0001 or 0 0.0001, yes. <clears throat> and we see that in code here. We would use the math.absolute value of the two numbers we wish to compare is that less than our value epsilon. So it's important to understand here the epsilon is going to be relative. So let's say we were comparing uh, the weight measurement for a person to see if it had changed. To see if, you know, a large number like 130.5 is equivalent to another measurement of 130.2. Well, maybe those are essentially equal, okay? However, let's say we were measuring the thickness of a sheet of paper. Well, uh, we would need greater precision, so our epsilon would have to be much smaller for two things to be considered equal if we were measuring something which was much smaller. So epsilon is not uh, always the same. It depends on the context of the situation. So let's look at some code that performs this sort of floating point comparison. So we declare a double variable called num meters, and we have assigned it the value 0 0.7, and then we are decrementing num meters 
by 0 0.4. So now num meters should be 0 0.3. And then we decrement num meters by 0 0.3. So num, num meters should now be 0. But actually, the value due to round off error is 0 0.0000, 000 a very long string of zeros, 55112. Understand, this is a tiny number. It's essentially zero. However, if you were to do an equals equals comparison between num meters and precisely 0, 0.0, it would return false. So rather than doing that, what we do is we are going to use the absolute value function on the difference between num meters and the value with which we, we want to compare. So we want to know if num meters is essentially zero. So we say num meters minus zero, take the absolute value of that quantity to remove the sign, and then we see if it is less than our epsilon value, which in this case we have declared, we have decided to use uh, 0 0.001. So if this is true, if the difference between num meters and zero is less than 0 0.001, then we will take the actions enclosed in the curly braces following this if statement. So the actions in which num meters is essentially equal to zero. Otherwise, we will execute the statements in the else. <clears throat> A better programming practice to be able to accomplish this would be to declare epsilon <clears throat> as a class constant. That way we don't have uh, extraneous double literals littered throughout the program without uh, any indication of why they're there. Notice an even better way to go about this than declaring simply a class constant would be to write a method called compare float and we would pass it the values to be compared as well as epsilon as parameters and it would return a boolean value for true if they were equal and a boolean value for false a uh, boolean value of false if they were not equal. So, so far in this class, we have mostly used variables and methods. Conceptually, variables represent data, while methods represent behavior or a set of behaviors. But it's actually possible to create a new type. So just like we have strings or integers you know, it's actually possible to create a new data type that are that is a combination of data and behavior. So these types, which we can create, are called object types or class types. Languages like Java, where you can declare these objects, are called object-oriented programming languages. It's common to hear the acronym OOP representing object-oriented programming. Um, this is something you're going to hear and deal with for the rest of your time at Vanderbilt, and definitely if you go into programming as a career, you will hear uh, discussions uh, regarding object-oriented programming. Actually, so we've already been using objects this semester, and I've alluded to it gently. We've been using the scanner to get input from the user. When we declare a variable of type scanner, we are creating an object. As the semester progresses, you'll learn how to create your own objects. So in Java, a class is either an executable program or a type of object. And in this sense, when we say type of object, we literally mean type, a data type for an object. So we have the scanner class and we can declare a variable of type scanner. So a class becomes a type for an object. So the class is actually the written code that defines the methods and data which are associated with the class. However, an object is an entity so it would be an instance of a class. So the scanner class is just a class until in our program we declare a variable of type scanner. 
So if we, if we declare a variable of type scanner and call that variable keyboard, and that's something we've done many times thus far, then scanner is a class, but keyboard is an object of type class. And that scanner object called keyboard contains data and can take actions, right? We, we use methods. We've, we've said things like keyboard.nextint and to get the next integer from the user. So the object can take actions that are defined by the methods written into the scanner class. So we've also seen the class string thus far. So string is a class, just like scanner is a class. And when we declare a variable, let's call it uh, my word. When we declare the variable my word of type string, we have now created an object of type string. So my word is an object. And this object has memory associated with it, and we store text characters in that memory. And that's the use of the class string. And it contains methods as well, right? To do uh, comparison, the equals method, as well as others, to lower, to upper. Um, so the class string has uh, memory associated with it for storing the characters, and it also has methods associated with it to perform actions. This is very similar to the class scanner, which we, which we mentioned a moment ago. So if we declare a variable of type scanner called keyboard, then keyboard is a object of type scanner. So the class is the code that defines what scanner is and it contains methods for what actions this scanner object can take. But the object doesn't exist until you create it. So in code when you say create the variable called keyboard of type scanner, keyboard is now an object of type scanner. So in our discussion of variables we said that a variable is actually just a memory location. And we store data in that memory location. However, it's important to understand here that depending on the type of variable, the memory is handled differently. So for primitive types, int, double, and char, <clears throat> the data which is to be stored in the variable is stored directly in the memory location assigned to the variable. But for variables of a class type, so for, so for an object, the memory location assigned to the variable doesn't actually contain all the memory for the object. The memory location which is assigned to the variable contains what's called a pointer. So this pointer points to the place in memory where we can find all the information about the object. Due to this difference in storage, objects, when passed into a method, so, so imagine an object is uh, declared and instantiated in the main, but then we pass that object as a parameter into a method. When we do an operation and change the object inside the method and then return to our main, the object which is stored in the main has also been changed. So actions taken inside the method can change the object stored in the main. That's different from what we said about primitives. We said that when a primitive is passed into a method, it is copied and therefore any actions taken inside the method do not affect the value of the variable stored in the main. So this is a fundamental difference between primitives and objects because as a, as a consequence of the way they're stored in memory. Now, strings are weird because strings are objects and therefore you would think that when you pass them into a method and you took an action that it would change the string fundamentally in the main just as we talked about for the objects. However, one of the weirdnesses about strings in Java is that strings are immutable. Immutable means the string can't change. Once you set the value inside that string, 
that value will not change. Now, you can, you can destroy that object and create a new string object with the same name and a different value, but you actually can't change the value that is stored inside that string. So because of that, we can pass them into methods and nothing will ever happen to the value stored in the string. And so functionally, it seems more like a primitive. So this is the reason you'll hear people say that strings are weird in Java, because they are objects, but they act more like a primitive in a lot of ways. So let's talk more about this difference in memory storage. So a variable of a primitive type can be associated with a particular memory location, but only one can be associated with that particular memory location. So let's look at how this plays out through an example. So imagine we are declaring a variable x of type integer and we wish to assign it the value 5. So what is actually happening is we have memory and we're just going to draw a very small amount of memory, only two locations. And it has the addresses 0 and 1. So this is memory location 0. This is memory location 1. <clears throat> then x when we declare it in our program, the runtime will allocate a memory location for x. Now notice, we're, it's not true to, to say that <clears throat> x contains a memory location. That is not true. x is a memory location. x represents a location in memory. So that location in memory then takes on the value which we assign the variable x. So we write down 5 in that memory location. And then later on in our program, we create another variable called y. So, in our, so when we declare the variable, the computer will allocate a memory location. So the next memory location we have is location 1. And it says, okay, now memory location 1 is synonymous with the variable y. Anytime in the program we see the variable y, we know that that means memory location 1. And we say we want to assign it x. Now remember, when we assign something, what we're actually doing is we, we are saying assign the variable y the value which comes from the evaluation of this expression. So we evaluate the expression x, and to do that, the computer is going to go to memory location x, and it's going to get the value. And so this expression evaluates to 5. So then we are going to assign the value 5 to the memory location y. So understand, we have two distinct variables, so therefore two distinct locations in memory. And this is because only one variable of a primitive type can be associated with a particular memory location. So this first memory location was already associated with the variable x. And therefore we couldn't associate any other variables with that memory location. And this is because x was declared as a primitive type, an integer. So then when we declared y as a primitive type, we had to associate it with a memory location that wasn't already associated with any other variable. Now let's discuss how variables of a class type are stored. So first of all, with primitive types, we made it very clear only one variable can be associated with a particular memory location. <clears throat> However, if we declare a variable of a class type, this variable may contain the same memory location as another variable. So let's, let's use an example. So first of all, we have memory location, and this is, this is called our stack. And then we have another memory location, and we'll call this the heap.
It's not very important to understand what stack and heap mean at this point, but that's just what we're going to refer to it as, okay? <clears throat> so let's say that we declare a variable of class type. So this is a scanner. So we declare a scanner called keyboard. And we'll go ahead and number these memory locations. 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 6. Okay. <clears throat> so we've created a variable called keyboard of type scanner. So this is now an object. Keyboard is an object. So this is how it goes into memory. So just like we did before with our primitive types, we are going to associate keyboard with one memory location. <clears throat> but then something that's different here so we're going to go over here and we will, in these first three slots, we're going, to, we're going to take this up and here's where we put our object. This is where we put all the memory for this scanner object. So we are using memory locations 0 through 2. And so over here in our stack, we write down zero and it knows where it ends because it knows how much memory is required. So memory location zero for the heap is stored in the variable keyboard. So understand this, we're creating a variable and it's associated with a memory location and that variable is called keyboard. But it's all about how Java interprets it and understands what's contained here. When, when we declared it as an integer, it understood, okay, we are going to interpret the value stored in this memory location as an integer value, as a numeric integer value. When we declare it of type scanner, it'll store the memory location of where to find the object scanner. And, the, and Java knows, okay, this is a type scanner, so I, this is a memory location. And what I do is I go to memory location zero, and there is the scanner. And then we declare another scanner, which is a no-no in this class. We're not supposed to do that, but oh, we did it anyway. And uh, the Zybooks environment is going to crash, but um, you know we'll get away with it in IntelliJ possibly. So we call it we call it user in. So we declare another variable of type scanner. And we call it user in. And in our code, we did the very same thing that we've done before with our primitive type. We said user in equals keyboard. So what happens when this, when this evaluates, rather than creating a new object, <clears throat> Java simply copies the memory address stored in the location keyboard and puts it into user in. So now if we do something and we change this object by accessing it using the user in variable, and then we go back and we access it using keyboard, we see that the changes we did to user in have also changed keyboard because fundamentally they're both pointing at the same location. So a good way to understand this is like having a copy of a key to the same house. Our object is stored in the heap and the key to the house is stored in the variable 
So then we can give a copy of that key to other variables and they can go look at that same house. So if one person with a key comes in and tears down a wall and leaves and someone else later comes in with a different key, they still find the wall torn down even though they have a different key because it's still fundamentally the same house. Variables of a class type which point to the same memory location, so they point to the same object, are referred to as aliases. Because even though they have different names and they have different locations in the stack, they are fundamentally accessing the same object and therefore they are two names for the same object. So they are aliases of each other. So we've discussed the details of how this works, but let's make sure that we absolutely understand the general idea. Because understanding the general way that this works for objects and primitive types in Java is fundamentally essential. So let's say that I make a word file and I include it as an attachment on an email and I send it to Cornelius. Cornelius downloads the word file from his, uh, from his email and he changes it. <clears throat> well, if I go in and access the copy I have on my computer, it's not changed because I created a copy and sent to him. So his version that he has on his computer is not linked to the version I have on my computer. This is how it is with primitive types. When you have a primitive type variable such as integer, so we say int x is equal to 5 as we have done previously, and then we say int y equals x, these are disconnected. That's a funky looking semicolon, but these are disconnected from each other. They're stored in separate memory locations, they have their own copies. This is like me creating a copy of a word file and sending it in an email to Cornelius. If he changes his, if down here we say x equals 3, then y is still equal to 5. It has not changed, even though x changed. On the other hand, let's consider what would happen if instead of creating a word file and making a copy and then sending that copy to Cornelius, let's say we wanted to be collaborative. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to be able to collaborate on this document, <clears throat> so I made it in Google Docs and I sent Cornelius a link to the file in Google Docs. So Cornelius goes online, he accesses the link, and he changes some things. Then I go to the Word file on Google Docs and access it. I'll, I will see his changes. He has changed the version that I can access as well. The reason is <clears throat> because we are fundamentally accessing the same document, whereas before we, we were accessing two separate documents. This is the situation with object types. Fundamentally, if you create a variable called x of type scanner, so we create a variable of x called x of type scanner, and we new scanner. So we've created this object of type scanner, and we've called it X. <clears throat> then we create another object of type scanner, and call it Y, and we set it equal to X. There exists in heap memory a scanner object. And both Y and X point to that precisely same object. So this is just like having a Google Doc and both me and Cornelius being able to access that same Google Doc. Anything I do to it affects what Cornelius has and anything Cornelius does to it affects what I have. So similarly anything you do using Y affects the same scanner which X points to and anything you do using X affects the same scanner which Y points to. 
So when we were dealing with variables of a primitive type, we had to declare the variable, and then before we could make use of that variable in the program, we had to also assign it a value. So when we're dealing with object type variables, we must also declare the variable and assign it a value, but the assignment process in creating a new object is slightly different than that of when we dealt with primitives. So when we create a new object, we actually have to use the keyword new, and then we have to use the constructor. So new objects require construction. So when we are dealing with variables of an object type, we have to declare the variable, assign this new variable a value, and we must construct the object which we wish to assign to this new variable. An example of this with which you should be familiar would be the scanner. So we declare a variable of type scanner, there's our declaration, we will assign it the object which we construct by saying new, new is a keyword, so we say new, then we, we again see the type, and we give <clears throat> whatever parameters are necessary to the constructor method. In this case, it requires system.in as a parameter. So this constructor builds a new object and then assigns that object through this assignment operator to the scanner variable called keyboard. Another common class in Java is the point class. Point is used to deal with x, y point coordinates um, and it contains built-in methods to you know, work with them a little more easily than having to hand code and do it yourself. So we can declare a variable of type point and this will be a point object. So let's look at the process of declaring a uh, point object called P1. So we have the type, which is point, which is the class name, and we have the name of the variable, which is P1. So we have declared a point variable called P1, and this variable will hold a memory location, which will be the location of a point object. But right now, this variable is uninitialized. We haven't assigned it anything. So we said to, to successfully uh, generate a new object, we have to create the variable, we have to construct a new object, and then we have to assign the variable the location of that object. So we've only done one of the three steps. We've created a variable of type point, but inside of P1, there's nothing because it's not been initialized yet. So there's no memory address and there's no point object to make use of at this time. So now we need to construct a new point object. So the keyword new will allocate memory in the heap for a point object and we'll create the point object using the constructor method built into the point class. This object will then be assigned to the variable P1. So what happens is the memory location in the heap of this point object which has been constructed will be stored, the memory location will be stored in variable P1. So technically what we would say about this is P1 holds a reference to a point object. So hopefully now it's clear that in, in this statement, what is occurring is we are declaring a variable called P1, and in that variable P1, we will store a reference to a point object. That's what this means. This tells, this tells Java, I want a variable called P1, and I'm going to put a reference to a point object inside that variable. And the right half of this statement constructs, which constructing means allocating the memory and uh, 
populating the memory based on any parameters that are necessary to be provided. So we, the right hand side constructs the object and the assignment operator assigns the memory location, the reference to that object, into the variable p1. This is how we declare and initialize objects. So like I said, a little bit different than declaring, declaring and initializing a primitive type variable. So more examples, we declare a point variable called p1 and we construct the object and we assign the reference to p1. We, can, we declare a point variable called p2 and we construct the point object and assign the reference to that object to p2. We declare a scanner variable and construct the scanner object and assign the reference to this new scanner object to the variable keyboard. We declare a variable of string type and we construct the string and we assign the reference to this string object to the variable name. Remember we said strings are weird so even though this is the uh, general way to declare an object and construct it, for strings we have a little bit of a shortcut we can use um, simply because Java treats them differently than other objects. So we can declare a variable of type string called artist name and we can construct a new string object which will contain the value Taylor Swift and we assign the reference to this new object to artist name and we can do this uh, in a very shorthanded way and this is the reason that we say that strings this is another reason we say that strings are a bit like primitives in Java so here we have a simple program dealing with a few point objects in Java let's take a behind the scenes look and evaluate exactly what this code is doing so in the first statement we are declaring a variable called p1 a point type we are constructing a new point object and constructing would be allocating the memory in the heap and initializing the object and then we assign that the reference to this new object to the variable p1 so first of all here's our stack here's our heap so we have declared a variable p1 which receives a memory location in the stack so there's p1 then we allocate memory and initialize a point object in the heap okay done then we assign the variable p1 a reference to this object's location in the heap. This is what is accomplished by the first statement in our code. In the following statement we do the precise same procedure but this time the variable's name is p2. So every variable gives its, gets its own memory location in the stack. So we declare a variable called p2 so we give it a memory location in the stack and we are constructing a new object so we have to allocate memory and initialize it based on the parameters and then assign a reference to that object to p2 so let's allocate the memory in the heap initialize the object and then finally we assign a reference to this object to the variable p2 so a reference to this new object is stored in the variable p2. Now in the next line notice we are declaring a variable called p3 of type point so that'll that'll receive memory in the stack but notice we're not constructing a new point object rather we are assigning p3 the value which is stored in p2 so we create the variable p3 in our stack 
but we don't allocate memory and initialize a new object in the heap. Instead, P3 gets the same reference to the same object which P2 contains a reference to. So in the next statement, we are going to use one of the methods included in the point class. So we say p3.setLocation. So we are going to change the data stored in the point object pointed to by p3. <clears throat> so Java will follow the reference from p3 to the object stored in the heap and the method changes the point from 7 minus 3 to 5, 1. Okay, in the next statement, we are going to do a print statement to show a parentheses. <clears throat> followed by p2.x so so we are accessing the variable x which is stored in the object p2 and then we will uh, follow it with a space and then in the following statement it's a print line statement so that means we'll end with a carriage return. Notice the previous did not end with a carriage return because we used a print statement. So we're going to pick up where we left off, just, just beyond the space. And we will print p2.y. So this is the y variable, which is stored in the object, pointed to by the variable p2. And then we'll terminate this with a parenthesis. So then, what's the output? Well. The output will be parentheses 5, 1, parentheses. So why, when we accessed P2, did we find 5, 1 when we assigned P2 to be 2, negative 4? Now we changed P3, but we didn't change P2, right? Wrong. P3 and P2 are just variables that hold references to an object. Both references point to the same object. So when we changed P3, we changed P2. Rather to say that more accurately, when we changed the object pointed to by P3, we also changed the object pointed to by P2. So then when we make a reference to a variable, which is part of the object referenced by P2, we are unintentionally, perhaps, also referencing the object which is pointed to by P3. So P3 and P2 are aliases of each other. P2 and P3 are two names for the same object. They're two variables which point to the same object. So then what happens when we need to pass a variable that is an object type into a method as a parameter, right? We do this already using uh, scanners. So in our main, we'll declare a scanner object. And then if we need to use that scanner inside of a method, we will pass the scanner into the method. So what is actually happening in this situation? When we were dealing with primitive data types, we said that when you pass something into a method, it copies the value into a new variable inside the method. So then what is happening when we pass in an object? To be able to answer that, we have to remember that a variable of object type actually holds a reference to the object's location in heap memory. So the variable doesn't actually contain the object. The variable contains a reference to the object. That's different than a primitive type. A primitive type variable actually holds the data. An object type variable holds a reference to the data. 
So when we passed in a primitive data type variable, we copied the contents of this primitive variable type into another variable of primitive type inside the method. So actually we're going to do the same thing with object type variables. We're going to copy the reference into a new variable inside the method. But remember, based on what we just talked about in the previous slide, if the reference is the same, you're looking at the same object. So even though we're passing in a copy of the reference stored in the variable, we are still pointing at the same object. And therefore, in both the main and the method, we are going to be looking at the same object. So for this reason, anything done to the object inside the method will also affect the object when you return to the main. Because both are fundamentally looking at the same object. So when we pass a primitive data type variable into a method as a parameter, we say it is passed by value because we are copying the value into the method. However, when we pass an object into a method, we say it is passed by reference because what we're actually passing in, copying into the method, is a reference to the actual object in heap memory. So let's look at an example to understand this. In this short piece of code, we declare a variable and construct a point object and assign the reference to that object to the variable p1. Then we are passing the variable p1 as a parameter to a method called example. Inside the method called example, we set the location of the object p1 to negative 1, negative 2. So let's look at how this will execute. So first of all, we declare the variable p1 in the stack. So it is allocated memory. And then we allocate memory in the heap for a point object. <clears throat> and then we initialize it based on the parameters and assign a reference to this point object to the variable p1. So p1 contains a reference to the object we have constructed and allocated space for in the heap. Then we call a method named example. So our program pointer will jump from the method call into the first statement inside the method. <clears throat> and we have copied the reference which is stored in variable p1 into the variable p. So we have allocated more memory in the stack for a variable called p. And p contains a copy of what was in p1. What was in p1 was a reference to this object in heap space. So when we get to this first statement inside the example method, we call the set location method on the object referenced by the variable p and we set the location to negative 1, negative 2. So now this object pointed to by the variable p has the value negative 1, negative 2, whereas before it had the value 2, 3. So when our program pointer jumps back to the main method, if we were to access p1 and print out the location, it would print out negative 1, negative 2 because the object pointed to by variable p1 is the same object which we changed by accessing it via variable p. So even though we copied the reference into the method, the object which is pointed at by that reference is the same in both situations. Both p1 and p point at the same object. So hopefully you understand now, if you pass an object variable into a method and you change the object inside the method, this object is changed even when you jump back to the main and attempt to access it via a different variable pointing at that same object. 
So here's a mini exercise for you to complete to make sure you understand what's going on. So take a second, pause the video, and write out what is going to be the output of this program. So before we give the answer, let's look at how it will execute. So first of all, we will allocate a place in stack memory for P1, and then we will assign it a reference to an object which we allocate memory for in the heap and initialize using the parameters 2 and negative 4 and the constructor for the point class. So we have allocated P1 in the stack and allocated our new point object and initialized it in heap memory. Then we assign a reference to that object's location in memory to the variable P1. We do the same thing to P2. We have declared P2, so we allocate memory for P2 in the stack. <clears throat> we construct a new point object in heap memory, and then we assign a reference to that object to the variable P2. <clears throat> now notice we have declared um, or we constructed these point objects pointed to by P1 and P2 to have the same locations. But it's not the same objects. Notice. So this is a distinct object from the object which is pointed to by P2. Not the same object. So that means a different memory location is stored in the variable P2 and P1. So then in the third statement, we declare a variable called P3, and it's going to be a point type, so we allocate space in the stack for variable P3, and then we are assigning P3 the value which is stored in variable P2. So what is the value stored in P2? Well, that value is a reference to an object. So we take the reference in P2 and assign it into P3. So now P3 contains an, a reference to the exact same object P2 references. Now let's look at the conditional statements. In the first if, we have a test to see if the value stored in P1 is equal to the value stored in P2. Now hopefully at this point you understand that the answer is going to be no. The value stored in P1 is not the same as the value stored in P2 because the value that's stored in P1 is the memory address of this object. However, the value stored in P2 is the memory address of the second object. <clears throat> so let's just say that this is memory address 0 and this is memory address 1. <clears throat> so P1 would contain the memory address 0 and P2 would contain the memory address 1. So no, P1 does not equal to P2. But what if instead of checking to see if the variable P1 equals the variable P2, if instead we used the method which is built into the point class called equals. And this method is going to see if the point stored in the object is equal to another uh, <clears throat> to the point stored in another object. So what is happening here? We say p1 dot equals. So this is the object referenced by p1 and we are using the method which is part of the class point and this method takes as parameter a point object and checks to see if the location is the same. And if this is true, we'll print out the number 2. And it is true because the location in both P1 and P2, the x, y point is 2, negative 4 in both situations. So we're going to print out 2, followed by carriage return. <clears throat> okay. In the final if statement, we are going to check if P2 is equal to P3. Now, what we're saying is, is the value stored in the variable P2 
equal to the value stored in P3. The value that is stored in P2 is the memory address of the second object. So we, we said this was memory location 1, so the memory location 1 is stored in P2. What's stored in P3? P3 also contains the memory address of the very same object. So the memory address 1 is also stored in P3. So therefore, this statement will evaluate to true and we'll print out a 3 on the next line. Why might objects be handled differently than primitive data types? The first reason to mention is efficiency. Objects can be very large, almost to the point that they can be arbitrarily large. So if we have this very memory heavy object and we have a reference to it stored in a variable, it's much easier to copy the reference to that object than it is to copy the entire object. What if that object took up a gigabyte of memory? Well, it, it could be quite time consuming in the program if we had to copy the entire object in situations where it wasn't necessary. So rather than passing the entire object as a parameter, we can simply pass a pointer to the object, a reference to the object, and this will achieve similar functionality as copying the entire object itself. Another reason is the ease of sharing. So objects hold <clears throat> state information, that's the data, and they have behaviors, that's the methods, which can modify the state. It's often necessary for, them, for these objects to be shared by different parts of the program. So if we already want to be able to share the same object with multiple parts of the program, it's easier to simply pass a reference to the object which we want to modify. So this decision to make objects passed by reference and stored as references in our variables is not an arbitrary decision, it is a design decision. So be careful when dealing with objects and make sure that you understand that when you pass an object into a method or when you assign an object type variable to another object type variable that you are still fundamentally accessing the same object. So far from the examples we've looked at we've seen that objects contain state information as well as behaviors. So state information we refer to as data and the behaviors are stored in methods. And an example of this you know our string, string methods for manipulating uh, a string We've used those extensively. String dot equals, um, string dot to lower, no such methods. When we call one of these objects methods, we have to specify which object we're talking about. So the variable name, which points to that object. And we also must specify which method we want to execute. And the way that we do this, the syntax we use is the name of the variable, which points to the object. And I'm not going to continue saying that. I'm going to use the shorthand. I'm going to say the name of the object. But understand, when I say the name of the object, I'm saying the variable name, which contains a reference to the object. But that's tiresome to say. So when we call one of these methods, we have to uh, use the name of the object dot the name of the method and then any parameters. And we've also seen the dot operator or the dot notation when we used math methods as well, such as round. So we used you know, math dot round. <clears throat> and dot notation is a common feature among most languages that are object oriented. So now that we've made the world a little more complicated, let's go back over strings to make sure that we haven't broken our understanding. So st string is a class. It's a class type, not a primitive type but we don't always have to use the keyword new when we create strings, when we declare a string. And this is because strings are special in Java. They're the only, well, it's the only class type that I'm aware of that you don't have to use um, the new keyword and the class constructor to create an instance. So a string is sort of a special exception to the rules of objects and classes. So remember that a value of type string 
is a sequence of characters and is treated as a single item. So we look at the string as a whole. But string is still a class, so we could use the new keyword along with the string class constructor to, uh, to construct a new string object. However, we don't have to. We can use the shortcut and declare the string literal. And we can also do that via declaring the string variable and then setting that variable equal to a string literal. So string concatenation is a common um, necessity in programming languages because we have to have some way of combining uh, strings of characters. And in Java, even though strings are objects, we can use the <clears throat> plus operator to concatenate them. So we have a string called greeting and we have a string literal. We can uh, write an expression that will evaluate to a string and this string will be stored in salutation. And then we can create another string variable <clears throat> and set it equal to the string literal how are you I love Google and then we can uh, issue a print line statement and in the expression that we pass to the print line statement we can perform um, plus operator concatenation between the schmoo string and the salutation string now we could we could uh, add together or sum together multiple strings at once if we so chose so for instance we could say greeting plus salutation plus schmooze and this this would um, evaluate to a string value so strings can be treated in a lot of ways in Java very similar to primitive data types again as we've said multiple times strings are weird the way that you index a string if we wanted to say um, access a specific character in the string is starting from zero all the way up to the length minus one so this string is 12 long but we're going to end on the number 11 because we started counting from zero so if we wanted to get access to the J in Java is fun we would have to look at index zero and the method used to get access to a character at a specific location in the string is to use the char at method so <clears throat> we'll declare a string variable and we will construct a new string object by declaring a string literal and we will place a reference to this new string object into the variable my name now let's say we want to access one of the characters inside this string we will say my name dot so we use the dot operator or the dot notation to access the methods which are a part of the string class and are a part of the my name object and we use the method char at and char at needs a parameter the parameter is the index of the character we wish to have returned so my name dot char at three will return k because the r would be zero the o would be one c2 k3 so the output is k another common task that we need to perform is to get the length of a string so to do this operation we have the length method built into the string class now we mentioned that uh, strings the index for a string begins at zero so um, the C in Rocky Jones exists at index location 2 however this does not affect the value which is returned by the length so for instance if we declare a string variable called my name and we assign it the value Rocky Jones <clears throat> and Rocky Jones has 11 characters in it including the space so when we print 
my name dot length, then the output 11 is printed to the console. Another common requirement is to replace a specific character in a string with a new character. So the method requires two parameters, the char to be replaced and the char to replace it with. <clears throat> so as an example, if we declare a variable called my name <clears throat> and the, the name is Donald Trump, then we use the method replace. So my name dot replace and as the old char we give the value t and the new char we give the value k. <clears throat> Anywhere a capital T occurs will be replaced with a capital K. Now we're not actually changing my name. My name remains unchanged. Strings are immutable. They don't change. Rather this method returns a new string altogether. So this method will return a new string object. It does not change my name. It creates a new string object and returns that object. And the output th then is Donald Crump. Equals ignore case. We've discussed this one previously, so I'll go through it very quickly. Um, it takes a string object as a parameter and it checks to see if they contain the same characters. So as an example, if we have a string called my name, the name contains Rocky Jones, and then we have another name called my name you, and we use the method my name dot to uppercase. <clears throat> Again, to uppercase will not change my name because my name cannot be changed. It is an immutable uh, data type. Strings are immutable. So rather than changing my name, what will happen is this will return a brand new object. So it will allocate memory and populate a new object in which all the characters that were used in my name are now uppercase. And this object will then uh, be assigned to the variable my name you. Now I'm saying it'll be assigned, but you understand, as we've discussed, since strings are objects, that actually this new object that was created in memory will not be assigned directly to the variable my name you. Rather, a reference to this new object created in memory will be stored in my name you. And then we will do the compare using um, my name dot equals ignore case. So now the previous version in which is stored in my name you is Rocky Jones with normal capitalization for names. My name you then contains the same name with all uppercase. So if we used my name dot equals, it would return false because it actually contains a different set of characters. However, if we use my name dot equals ignore case, then it contains the same uh, characters when we remove capitalization and it will print out the, ver the value true. Another operation that you'll run into from time to time is the need to find the location of a substring inside of a given string. <clears throat> a couple of things about this operation, this method index of, it will, it will return the index of the first occurrence of the substring, so it doesn't return all of the occurrences of it. So if you had just an alternating pattern of the letter T followed by the letter O, so to 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 to, <clears throat> and then you ask for the index of T O, it's going to return the, only the first one. So if there are multiple, this won't give you all of them, it'll only give you the first. It'll return negative one if there are none in the, in the string. And remember, if it happens to start at the beginning location, then it's gonna return a zero because the index of the first character is zero. So now, working through an example, we create a variable called my name, and it's a string variable, and we give it the value Rocky Jones. And we are looking for the space. So we're looking for the location which splits up the two names. So we do my name dot index of. <clears throat> now notice we didn't declare a char space, so this is not single quotes. We're not giving it a char literal because index of requires a string parameter. So we give it a string with a space as the value, and it returns the index of the first space it finds in my name. 
and this is stored in the variable we have now declared called loc for the location and we print this out to the console location is 5 so 0 1 2 3 4 5 now we create another variable called last in it <clears throat> and it's a char type and we get the value of the char which is located at index loc plus 1 so loc contains the value 5 we add 1 to it that's 6 so we're getting the char at index 6 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 so what we're doing is we're attempting to find the last initial so my name dot char at loc plus 1 will get us the last initial of this person's name which is J So here is a familiar list of string methods. Feel free to pause and look through each of these to understand what they do. We've talked about them previously, um, but reading documentation is helpful and it's a skill that you need to learn. So I would encourage you to pause for a moment and read through each of these methods. I've been mentioning this along the way, but strings are immutable, therefore they don't change. So it's, it's a conceptual thing. You need to understand that when a string appears to be changed, it's not changing. Strings don't change. So if we declare a string called s and we give it the value bow wow and we say s dot to uppercase so this is going to return a new string that has the same contents as s however now all the characters will be uppercase. It does not change s because when we print s out we will still see bow wow lowercase so the output will be lowercase bow wow if you want to modify and store into a variable you have to declare a new variable so we have our s which we've set equal to bow wow and we declare another string variable called t then we can capture the value which was re returned by s dot to uppercase in the variable t now if we print the variable t we will get the uppercase bow wow so know that keep that in your head strings don't change they're immutable they never change once you've declared them they don't change if you call to upper or to lower those are returning a new string they're not changing the existing string why yes because strings don't change they're immutable so as a final word on strings let's walk through an example program where we're going to do various uh, manipulations and use a couple of methods from the string class. <clears throat> so we create a variable that is a string type called sentence and we put the string text processing is hard into that variable. Okay, next we're going to declare a variable called position of type integer. Then we are going to assign this expression to the variable position. So we know that position is an integer, so this expression must evaluate to an integer. So we're going to call the index of method, which is a part of the sentence object, which is a string class object. So the index of the substring hard. And our original string was text processing is hard. So we're going to store the index of the H into position. Next, we are going to print sentence. So let's see, that should print text processing is hard. Yes. <clears throat> Next, we are going to print a large group of numbers which I don't feel like reading yes then we will print the word double quotes because we're using an escape sequence to um, tell the compiler we want to have 
a double quotation mark here, we're not actually starting a new string. So the word quotation marks hard end quotation marks starts at index space and then we're going to concatenate that string with the value stored in position. And the printout to the console will be the word hard starts at index 19. The next statement is going to assign the variable sentence to a new object. So understand what's happening here. You're going to think that sentence changed, but it didn't. So we have sentence, which is, which is an object containing the text, text processing is hard, or the string text processing is hard, and we're going to call the substring method, and we want the substring which starts at index 0 and ends at position. So the result will be text processing is space, but it won't include the H because we always leave off the end position and the H is at the uh, 19th index and we will, so we will go from zero to the 19th index, but we will not include the character which is at the 19th, in, at 19th index. So this will return a string that says text processing is space. And then we will concatenate that string with the string easy exclamation mark. So understand what has happened. This method returns a new string object. This is a string object. Then we have concatenated these two string objects into a new object. And we have now assigned the memory location for this new object into the variable sentence. Now we will print the, the uh, literal value, the string, the change string is, followed by the new sentence. So the change string is, text processing is easy. So make sure that you understand we did not change the string. What we did when we assigned the variable sentence to this value was make a new string object which exists somewhere else in memory and assign that new memory location to sentence.